Tom here from Lawrence Systems. We all want our backups to be secure and immutable, but what does it actually take to get there? If I set the data on this drive to be immutable, does that protect it from going away if I drop it or take it apart? Of course not, and that's the point. Immutability isn't magic, it's design. It only works when you separate the control plane from the data plane. Without that separation, all those immutable claims are just marketing words. Today, we're gonna break down what immutability really means, how object locking, snapshots, and pull beast replication actually make your backups more resilient from both failures and malicious attacks. But before we get started, this is not sponsored by any backup vendors, but this video is sponsored by Meter, the company rethinking how enterprise networks are built and managed. Meter delivers wired, wireless, and cellular networking in one integrated solution, covering everything from hardware and software to deployment and support. Instead of juggling multiple vendors and fragmented tools, you get one stack that's fast, secure, reliable, and scalable, whether you're a branch office or a data center. Thank you to Meter for sponsoring this video. Go to meter.com slash Lawrence Systems to book a demo. That's M-E-T-E-R dot com slash Lawrence Systems to book your demo today. The first concept I want to start with is data plane versus control plane. I used that to begin the video and I'm going to use it a few other times. So let's make sure we're clear on what this means. Data plane is where your data lives. It's where the bits are actually at, the files, the snapshots, the storage itself. The control plane is where the decisions are made, the admin portals, the orchestration tools, your backup software, the API setup, and the credentials. This is all where you set things up versus where the data is. Those can be separate. And I'll give more detailed examples, but essentially the web interface for a NAS is the control plane and the NFS or SMB share on that NAS would be an example of a data plane. Same thing with cloud backups. You will have the portal by which you'll set up the cloud software, your login for that cloud software or cloud backup portal. And then the API key you set up then allows the data plane to talk. So the software that may need that API key to get that data to the cloud, that's being done on the data plane. And getting access to that API key won't allow control or changes to be made to the control plane. These are really important concepts and they're the basis for much of this. Air-gapped backups. I'm not going to talk too much about these, but air-gapped backups are the original immutability. You can't delete what you can't reach and that's the upside. The downsides, you can't automate what you can't reach either. Well, kind of you can automate it. And I used to work for a company in the 90s that had bought closed banks and used the vaults for a backup rotation. So I guess the automation you could say is the fact that we curried around the tapes and a rotation to different clients in the area and would store them in the vault. So if you're thinking of automation and you're including humans in the loop, sure. But this is the challenge. You have some humans in the loop disconnecting or reconnecting a NAS or in the case of the 90s for me, it was tapes and tapes are still somewhat common here in 2025, but a little bit less so than they were a long time ago. So while it's a solid strategy, it's not always that practical, but there are absolute mission critical things that this is still done for. And I've seen people with simple setups of just simply turning off the NAS and physically turning it on, because if it's off, it's unreachable. And if you take that NAS and maybe bring it somewhere else, now it's away from where your original data is. So it is a strategy, but it's just a little less common because of, well, unless humans are in the loop, automating it gets a little challenging. Object locking. Think of it as a time lock safe where the data is protected by time, not trust. You define the retention policies in the control plane, the web interface you log in, usually for some type of cloud storage or bucket service. Then generate an API key for your backup software to use. That API key can write and read data, but cannot delete anything that's time locked. For example, you would go in and set a policy of, I don't want anything to be deleted for 30 days. Within that 30 days, the API key can read any of that data and it may request that it be deleted, but it will not be able to because the API key is only permitted to delete data older than 30 days. So you can have a retention policy set up within the backup software that allows the API key to say retain for 45 or 90 days. But if anyone were to access or be a malicious actor taking control of that backup software or extract the API key from it, they can't send a command back up to the cloud that will delete things beyond what the retention date. This is back to why it's so important to have control plane versus data plane. Data plane being controlled along the API key, it has to follow rules. Your login for that username, password, hopefully a two-factor protects you from anyone getting rid of your backups beyond the retention policy. So even if something happens on site where these are, the cloud will still follow those retention rules. And as I said, it's protected by time, not trust based on those policies. 
Now, snapshots can apply to cloud, but usually are going to apply to local NAS. Both ZFS and ButterFS support snapshots, and a variety of devices support this as well. A snapshot captures the exact state of your data at a given moment. As your data changes, new blocks are written elsewhere while the snapshot keeps the originals intact. They are great, provided you keep control plane and data plane separate. Once again, the login to your NAS will set a retention policy. Then NASs are frequently shared over SMB or NFS. So the sharing protocol should not have the same credentials as the web interface or whatever interface it has to control the NAS. This is once again a complete separation. So someone logs in and the backup software ILE is able to do what it needs to do and read and write data, move data around and do the backups as it does. But if someone gets in there and tries to delete them all, you would have a snapshot policy. And the worst case scenario is you lose whatever that snapshot retention time is. And in the case of 30 minutes, you would lose 30 minutes worth of changes that you would be able to immediately roll back to. And because those rollbacks and control are done via the control plane of the NAS, that would protect you from any real damage if someone were to extract the credentials or get access to the credentials that control the NFS or SMB or however the data plane is being shared. Now let's talk replication. Replication is how you move data, or more specifically in this context, snapshots from one system to another. Having all the snapshots on your primary NAS is great. Having them on another one is even better. It's a solid strategy to have a second copy of all the data, but the direction for pushing or pulling the data matters. Push is when the source system sends data to the destination. So the source system has a policy set to set replication, has credentials to log into that system and sends the data, pushes it over there. When it pushes it over there, it's also setting the policies like how long they should be retained for. Usually you're gonna have them the same policy as what your snapshots are. So if we're doing 24 snapshots a day, doing them hourly and we're expiring them after seven days, well, that same retention policy might be pushed through the replication as well. Pull, though, is the destination system connects and pulls data from the source. Pull replication is safer because the backup system controls what's copied. So if you have your main NAS and it's running all these snapshots and someone compromises that NAS, well, they now are in the control plane and then would be able to set policies of what that next replication runs going to do. Maybe delete all the files or send data versus a pull replication. If you have a retention policy built on the system that's doing the poll replication, that'll allow you to have retention policies that are different than the source system. Maybe you have a 30 day or 40 day retention policy. And if someone compromises the main system, hopefully you notice it before it pulls 30 or 40 days worth of those backups. So this gives you a little bit more resiliency because it has the ability to log into the source system, but the source system doesn't have the logins for the destination. Each one of these should be separate. Now let's put this all together. You have your data here. And then we have our backup software. Now, each of these is the control plane over here. And this is essentially where the data plane is going to live. So your data is on these systems and we have the backup software that's going to perhaps have an agent that's running or maybe the backup software has ability to mount a share. Either way, the backup software is a central part of control. So we have a username and password, whether it's managed from the cloud or managed locally, that it allows us to set up the backup software, set whatever policies in there, but it needs to send things off site to, let's say a cloud backup service or a cloud bucket service. So that cloud interface should have another set of credentials. That's the control plane for that. Hopefully you've got two factors set up and then you generate an API key that allows the backup software to talk to your cloud backup. And that API key will be governed by the rules you set in the cloud backup, such as the time-based, we can only delete objects in this bucket that are older than whatever those retention periods. Once again, time not trust is the key here. So if anyone compromises the backup software, gets the API key, they can't destroy your cloud backups. Then we go down to the backup software talking to an on-site NAS. The backup software talks to the NAS and the backup control interface uses the SMB, S3, or NFS credentials, the common file sharing that you may use, to have all that data put on the NAS. And if someone compromises any of those credentials out of the backup software, those credentials aren't the same as the NAS control interface. But just in case, we want to have another copy of all those snapshots because as the backup software writes that to the NAS, we've set a snapshot retention policy to the NAS and maybe we're also using it as a file server. So it's doing its thing with all the snapshots. And then we want pull replication. 
as we said, pull replication is safer to the second NAS. That way, if somehow someone compromises the NAS and they figure out on the control interface the username, password, credentials to log in, and they go, I'm going to destroy all the data on here when the other NAS is pulling the backups and it has its own set of retention policies. And really, I hope it has a separate set of credentials that weren't the same as here. It's going to pull that. Now, if it does pull one of these deleted backups, yeah, that one's deleted, but you've now set a pull backup strategy and a long retention policy. And hopefully you notice before that retention policy expires, let's say it's 30 days. And within those 30 days of retention, you've noticed someone has deleted backups and now you have a, another way to recover on site. So this whole strategy is the resiliency that you need to create these backups. It's not just saying we check the box to make it immutable. It's immutable based on no one getting control of any of these. And if you think that clouds are always immutable because they have that checkbox, try just not paying the bill. You'll find that that's a failure point as well. Uh, people have got caught up where they've lost data in the cloud because if the credit card's not there, that is one more place that you need to think about resiliency. That's why I mentioned having a couple of copies on site as well. And if you're lucky enough not to have of cloud backups because you have two locations, that's an awesome solution. Well, you can take this NAS, use it over a VPN where it reaches out and talks to the other NAS and still does that poll replication. And with any of these, you can have more than one. I just put two in here, but of course, maybe you want five copies of your data. So you buy five NASs and scatter them around to different sites. So it's not about buying a product that says immutable on the box. It's about how you design the system separating your control planes from your data plane, using object locking the right way, keeping snapshots protected by pulling, not pushing. Do these things and you're not just checking a marketing box, you're actually protecting your data. I also have deeper dives and videos showing you how to set these things up on both Synology and TrueNAS, including hardening guides. So if you wanna see those hands-on configurations, check those out, you'll find them in the description down below. I'm curious how you've handled immutability in your setup. Drop your thoughts and comments. Love to hear what's worked and what hasn't. Thanks for watching. You can connect with me over in my forums or on the socials at lawrencesystems.com.